Good evening and welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur, a series of conversations with startup founders and their investors on what it takes to build a viable, fundable startup. I'm Chris Gill, President and CEO of SVAs, the Silicon Valley Association of Startup Entrepreneurs, the largest and fastest growing not-for-profit in Northern California, dedicated to helping entrepreneurs across all technologies build successful companies. This week I'm interviewing Scott Wharton, founder and CEO of Vidtel, and their lead investor in the first round of financing, Wayne Willis. So Scott and Wayne, uh, good to see you. Welcome to the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur. Thank you for coming along. Great, thanks for having us. Scott, let me start with you if I may. What were you doing before you founded Vidtel? Well, I was in the voice of RIP and video business for the last 13 years. I actually started with the very first voice of RIP company. So mm. for those of the People watching, if they remember internet phone, talk for free over the internet, that was me. I did that for about four years. We went public right after Netscape. And then I was spent nine years working for a company called Broadsoft, and they're the leading provider of voice or IP application servers. So they power eight of the top 10 <coughs> telcos worldwide, as well as about 500 service providers around the world. OK, OK. Um, we'll come back to that, because this, this is a really, very interesting aspect of it. Wayne, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you became an investor? Well, I was a co-founder of Hyatt Legal Services, which was a chain of law stores back in the 1980s. You may remember my partner, Joel Hyatt, on television talking about uh, coming in and getting legal services. I was the uh, chief operations officer there. Mm -hmm. And in 1990, I... Uh, I uh, sold my interest there and invested in a company called Voicetel, which was a voicemail service bureau. And we sold that quite successfully in the mid-90s. And from that point on, I've been doing some angel investing, some advising companies, and basically doing what I'm doing here at uh, Vidtel, helping out uh, with the startup and launch of service-based companies that are based on technology. Okay, that's terrific. Thank you. And we'll definitely come back and do some more exploring there because this is an interesting aspect. So back to you, Scott. So what caused <coughs> you to leave, I mean, two very successful companies, you're doing some great things there. What caused you to leave that company to, to spring out and start something on your own again with Vidtel? Well, I think it's a combination of things. Like a lot of people here in Sil Silicon Val Valley, I had the bug or the disease for uh, starting something new. And after nine years at the prior company, we were doing very well. We were in 65 countries, 350 people. We were starting to look to go public and do all the Sarbanes-Oxley compliance stuff. Uh -huh. And I started getting the itch to start something new. Uh, secondly, I've been had the privilege of really talking to all of the big service providers around the world. And one of the things that became clear to me is that they see themselves very much as being in the voice business. And I saw an opportunity to bring video into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And at first, I tried to sell it as part of my capacity at Broadsoft to these carriers. And they said to me, Scott, you don't understand. We're in the voice business. So I took that as an opportunity and a market void to uh, go out of my own and, and put my money where my mouth is. Instead of giving people advice, I said, all right, I'm going to take my own advice and uh, try to tackle this market opportunity. Okay, so let me just understand it. So you've been in the industry uh, <coughs> for several years. Since the beginning. Yep. And you've been through two successful companies. And you saw an opportunity that the company you were with at the time didn't want to take ad 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 advantage of. And that was your spur to step out from that to start the new startup. Well, part of what we were doing was selling the technology to service providers around right. the world. And I, what, the opportunity that I saw is that a lot of the current service providers were a little bit more risk averse. Mm -hmm. And I, I had the opportunity to see all of the great technology was out there, including my prior employers. And since I thought that other people weren't going to take the plunge, I had the uh, their perspective to see how I could take all of these pieces and instead of try, just trying to sell it to another service provider, in fact, becoming a service provider ourselves okay. and then selling it directly to end users, both consumers and small business. Okay. As we were talking earlier, I found out that not only did you st step out to start Vidtel, but you also moved here to Silicon Valley from the East Coast. So what did your family think about both of those things? Well, my wife had grown up in California, so she had been bugging me for years saying, Scott, hey, oh, okay. when are we going to move to California? And actually, before I went to Broadsoft, we were living in the New York area right. and took the job in D.C. in 99. And my wife and I said, OK, it's a startup. It, you know, a year or two, it'll fail. And then we'll move to California. Well, nine years later, it didn't fail. And we're doing extremely well. 
And she said, okay, and well, honey, let's go. <laughs> so uh, we figured Silicon Valley, best place in the world to start a company, and right. the weather being what it is is not a, not a bad point either. So uh, we just decided, uh, quit my job in April, uh, moved out here in June, got some initial funding in July, and we built the team and launched our first service very quickly. So in December, we became commercially live and mm -hmm. we're generating revenue. Okay. Um, so, Wayne, if, if I can come back to you a little bit, please, and, and, and probe a little bit here. How did you come to be involved with, with, with Vidtel and Scott? Well, I've known Scott for uh, 11 or 12 years now. So uh, we, were, we met at an alumni event, and I've tried to recruit him into several companies. Uh, I saw him as a marketing star and tried to get him into several companies I was an investor in. Um, we came close a couple of times, but uh, never could land them. Mm -hmm. And when he was vetting the idea, he called me up and said, what do you think of the idea? And we talked about it further. And I got very excited about it because I, I've seen a lot of service-based businesses and I liked all of the properties of this. And of course, Scott is fairly unique in having all these relationships with uh, people who could be partners, people who could potentially be competitors. So he knows what they're doing, both uh, strengths and weaknesses. And um, uh, he brings the uh, youth and passion as well as the experience to uh, do all the heavy lifting of being a, being a founder and a startup uh, entrepreneur. Terrific, okay, thank you for that. So let's hear a little bit more from you, Scott, about the product because voice over IP is now fairly well established, at least in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and, and, and video over IP is, is not that unusual. You get a camera and a new laptop. Right. So why a video phone? T tell us about it, what makes it different, and what, why, why it's, what you think its future is. So the opportunity that we saw was that if you look at video telephony today as opposed to video television, there are two markets. There's high-end video conferencing, mm -hmm. so Cisco Telepresence and Polycom, and it works great. The quality is very good, but it's very expensive, and you typically need an IT manager to set everything up. And then the low end, you have things like Skype and Yahoo and Google, and while they're unbeatable with the price, very often you either need both sides to be technically savvy or you need your computer on all the time. So it's not as convenient as using a phone. So we saw this void in the middle where if we could make video telephony as simple and as easy to use a telephone call and make it reasonably priced and give support, we thought there would be a big market for the rest of us that are not sitting on our computer all day and using Twitter 24 hours a day. Right. So basically the service that we're offering is a, it's a phone service. So you can make calls with telephone numbers and call anyone in the world with voice. Um, but if Right today we're selling with a video phone, like I'm showing here, and it's got a camera and a screen. So if you call someone and they, uh, they have a voice line that you can talk to them, and if they have video, you can see them. So it's that simple. So does the person at the other end have to have one of these, or could they have their computer at the other end, let's say? So part of our vision is that we want to make video universal and mm -hmm. take all the different islands that together and link them together. So we started out with the idea of making, allowing people to call from a telephone to another, but we're pretty lap rapidly allowing people to call from their computer, from their mobile phone, from their game player television, any endpoint that has a little camera in there. Uh -huh. We're going to link them okay. all up together. For example, when you make a phone call today, you don't think about on the other side whether they're on the same network. You just take for granted that it works. And we're trying to do exactly the same thing for video. Got it. Okay. Um, circle back around to some of that in, 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 in a minute, but I, I will come back again to... Um, how you and Wayne met and how, how you got, what attracted you to Wayne as a potential in, in, in investor in the organization? Well, part of what attracted me to Wayne is he has a lot of experience in telecom and service providers, mm -hmm. but also has a lot of experience in business. And when we first met him, it was years ago, as he said, and uh, I was attracted to Wayne that we both had the same business school alumni connection. Mm -hmm. And I thought there was a lot that I could learn from his experience and wisdom. And as Wayne said, uh, he tried recruiting me three times, but what he doesn't say is that I've now jujitsu him, <laughs> kind of hired, hired, essentially hired him, and, and uh, we also get along really well. And uh, you know, part of a good partnership and an investor relationship is having a good rapport and vision about where you want to take things. Okay. So uh, you came together, quite a long relationship. You, 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 you known each other for a while. How did you pull together the founding team? Well, partly pulled together the founding team based on knowing a lot of the people in the industry. So it, this may sound like a bad Ocean's Eleven movie, but I, I literally went around <laughs> to the people that I knew and asked people in the industry who were the best people in particular skill sets, and I just started recruiting them. 
and pulling them in. So one of our chief technologists, he came from one of the most successful service providers in the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And somehow I was able to drag him out here and uh, leave his cold weather in Boston and right. come out here to California. And uh, the same with the rest of the team, people that I knew from experience or uh, strong recommendations to bring them together. And people that also shared in both the vision of what we're trying to build, mm -hmm. but also had experience of building a startup. Because as you know, and uh, our viewers know, working at a startup is very different than working at a big company and the sacrifices that it entails. So had you worked with these big people in the past or, or, or were they uh, all recommendations from, from, from people that, you, that you'd known? It's a combination. I mean, one of the challenges that I had, as we talked about earlier, I actually, when we moved here from the East Coast to the West Coast, had to somewhat rebuild our network a little bit. Mm. So if we had started the company in the East Coast, I probably could have pulled together a lot more people that I knew. Um, but it was pretty easy once we got here based on knowing people and building relationships fast to get the right people. So uh, I feel pretty good that we have a very solid, experienced team and we're working very well together. Okay. So what was the first thing that you got going on? You've, you've, you've got an investor, you've now got a team, you've moved to Silicon Valley to make it all happen. So you've got all the right ingredients in the, in the pot. What was the first big thing that you got going on? Well, the first thing that we did, and it was really a radical approach to running a service, if you think about how phone companies operate, typically what they do is they say, if you just give me $50 million or a billion dollars, I'll go build you this network, and then we'll launch the service. What we did, which was pretty different, is we said, let's take all of the cost and the elements of a service, and let's see if we can buy them all on a variable cost or success-based mm -hmm. basis. So we set out to build this network, not with building everything in-house, but essentially taking pieces together and partnerships with the idea that we wanted to prove the market for video telephony and show how it works on the marketing side, and then we can go out and optimize and build things in-house. So we told people that we were going to build a very scalable video telephone network for a quarter million dollars, and people said, Scott, you're crazy. It's impossible. You can't do that. We said we're going to do it for a quarter million dollars, we're going to do it by the beginning of 2009. So what happened was we actually launched it in December, and we did it for under $200,000, and we proved everyone not only wrong, but we we beat our expectations and came in under budget, which is not something you hear most entrepreneurs. Wow, so. that is very impressive. Uh, and I didn't previously know, know that. that that's, that's super impressive, particularly in the current climate. I mean, that's outstanding. Well, it, became, uh, it was a nice idea. It became a necessity in the current <laughs> environment. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and Wade, what's, what's your role been in all of this? Well, I've been uh, helping assemble the uh, other investors, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm acting as the CFO, so I've come in to help put in the administrative structures. Right. I have a background in law, so w if a supply contract needs to be reviewed, I can do that and uh, help out with the general administrative and finance back office kinds of systems. The other, uh, Scott's been a little humble about the other members of the team. He's got uh, a, a network of advisors who are CEOs of major telephony companies who are on our advisory board, um, former chairman of the FCC. We've got a very good advisory board, and they've been feeding us candidates, especially in this environment. We've got a very, very talented team, and uh, I, I feel very uh, lucky, frankly, to be hanging out with uh, really smart people. I'm learning a lot about telephony, even though I have run a couple of telephony companies. Hmm. There's a lot going on right now on the... Uh, cost and regulatory and technical sides that is very exciting. And we're able to bring it right in and uh, improve the quality of service, reduce the cost, make it uh, plug and play, very simple, easy to use, sort of following the, the Apple model of keep it simple, make it fun. Well, that's a good point too, in that it's not just the team that we built, but it's really the extended team. So as you said, we probably have, what, tw a couple of a dozen advisors that are very senior and they all want to help out and contribute because they like the vision that we're, uh, mm -hmm. that we're laying out. It's no short of creating the biggest world's uh, video telephony network. And that helps us do so much more than what we could do but just by hiring core people. So I think that's a good lesson, I think, for us and for entrepreneurs, that it's not just what you can do, but it's what your extended network can do to help you as well. Okay. Well, talking about that, it, it, it sounds like it's all gone quite smoothly. You've come in um, within time, within budget. There had to have been some major challenge along the way there. What, 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 was, what was the biggest challenge that you had, and how did you overcome that? Well, there was a small thing that happened uh, last year called the global meltdown. <coughs> and that obviously had an impact on our business plan. Mm -hmm. So that really had two effects. So one is on the consumer side. 
it's become a lot, a lot more challenging, as you can imagine, to sell uh, new services and new ideas to consumers. Mm -hmm. So probably what I would say is the consumer business has been a little bit cooler and slower than what we've expected. On the plus side, what's happened is because businesses can't travel as much and they still need to conduct business and they don't want to spend tens or thousands of dollars or millions of dollars on travel or video, that we found that our solution, because it's really priced like a phone service, we've had so much more interest from the small medium business market and literally, when we launched, we've been inundated with channels that want to sell our service that we're mm. getting at least one a day in all shapes and sizes calling us who uh, they want to sell our service. And this is everywhere from the small service providers in the middle of Kentucky to some of the largest phone companies and institutions in the world. So what could have been perceived to have been a major challenge, in fact, turned out to be to have a silver lining for you. Um, that's, that's terrific. A good example of being nimble, too. Uh, we thought initially that going direct to market with consumers would be the right way to demonstrate the market and control your destiny. But, you know, if five people tell you you're a horse, you start trying on saddles. It's a <laughs> that's, that's a good analogy. I like that one. Um, now, um, I, I know you were involved f fairly early on, Wayne, um, but uh, Scott, when did you think about venture? funding and how you were going to, to raise it. Was that right at the outset earlier, you know, or, or did this happen? Was this just a fortuitous thing? Well, we started, Wayne and I started talking about this in January of, of uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And um, this was part of the, the value of having a, a mentor and someone that you like working with. And that right. He can not only vet the idea, but help to introduce me to here in the people in the Valley that could also help vet the idea. And when we started getting enough positive feedback, we decided to go out. So one of the things that we did that was part of the switching gears is as we started talking to venture capitalists and friends of mine that were in the industry, and I started telling them about this idea of that, hey, I can launch for a quarter million dollars. They said, Scott, I'm your friend. I would love to give you the money, but if you can do it for a quarter million dollars, you know, name that tune. You should go do it. So part of what we did to shift is we said, okay, let's, let's go out and raise angel money instead. Mm -hmm. So with Wayne's help, we went out and did just that over the summer, and that helped us get going and launch the company. Um, was this at the idea stage? Did you have a prototype at that time? Did, what, what, what sort of stage was this at? I would say it was more at the idea stage. Okay. And, and, and that's pretty unusual in, in, in the current climate to raise, to raise money from angel groups at the idea stage. They generally want to see something. They generally want to see some customer traction. Why do you think you were able to raise that, that money at that early stage at that time? Well, I think I would say it, w it was mostly individuals and not formal okay. angel groups. And, okay. and the main reason why they were investing is I think they, they invest in the people and the team. So I think a lot of them were people like Wayne and others that I'd worked with over the years mm -hmm. and had the opportunity to see me. And it was really just me at that point. Um, work and uh, we're just taking a bet, I guess, that I could raise, I could raise more money and build a team and pull it off. And uh, you know, part of we we haven't made it there all the way yet, but I think we've helped validate at least their initial inclinations. I mean, Wayne, do you have anything to add to that? You know, was That's it the exact. idea? Was it, the, was it was it the 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 people? That were more, what was the most important factor? Uh, there's three factors: uh, people, people, and people. And Scott was the only person initially. <laughs> But okay. he comes well recommended, and, and again, that group of people around him, the introductions from people who became advisors. And the reality is that people would look at the idea and, and say, I think that, that looks like, you know, this is the time for video. A lot of uh, evidence that it's a, it's a wave that's going to happen. If you say to somebody, there's going to be a screen and a camera in 10 years, and all of our communications is going to be going through a screen and a camera, People go, that, yeah, I think that's right. You mm -hmm. know, there's enough, there's enough um, awareness driven by the high-end Cisco telepresence and the low-end Skype and, and iChat and so on that people say, yeah, there's a big, vast middle, and here's somebody who's spent 13 years developing go-to-market strategies as a market, chief marketeer of the two the dominant companies in the space. Seems like a good bet. Okay, and, and I think that's an important thing that... Anybody can have the idea, but it takes a team to make it happen. So you know, the video phone has been tried a number of times over the years, mm -hmm. but, but nobody's really been that successful with it. So having somebody who, who who's, you can be convinced will be able to make it happen, that would appear to be the major right. factor. That's right. 
And is, is, is that common in the investments that, that you get involved in? That it's, it's the people more than the Absolutely, idea? it's the people. Uh, and you learn that the hard way. Uh, I can show you some failures that were great ideas and mediocre people. Right. Um, it's the other way around. You very seldom find really good people with poor ideas because they typically find the problems with the ideas early on. So, you know, the fundamental rule is, you know, look to the people first and you can vet the idea a second, but uh, if the people are the right people, then most likely they're, they're going to have figured it out. And invariably, the ideas that you start with, you may have the vision and the vision may stay the same, but the ideas of usually how you get there zigzag, just like we talked about it, but the difference between the consumer and the business market. So mm -hmm. you want to, I think you want to bet on a team that can zigzag along with the market and make the right zigs, not the wrong zags. Okay. Now you, you got this going in a remarkably short amount of time. So you, you raised, you had the idea, you raised Andrew, Andrew money in, in January of 2008. Actually, July. July of 2008. Right. And you've now got a product and you have customers. Right. How did you do that in such a short time? I think it's a combination of things. I think it's based on a lot of experience at working at startups where you figure out how to do things very quickly and and uh, part of it just having 13 years of experience in this industry where you know how everything works and finding the right people that have done it before. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it's just part of our, we took a strategy that ended up working out that everyone said couldn't work and couldn't be done, but I knew it could be done. Found a group of people that shared the same vision and then we went ahead and, and did it. And sometimes when you don't have, you know, I heard Scott McNeely talk a few months back and he said the worst thing you can do for a startup is give it too much money. Because what happens is you go out and you just replicate everything the same way it's been done before. If you don't have as much money, it really forces you to be creative and do things in a different way. And that's exactly what we did. And a lot of people, as I said, said they thought for sure we were going to fail. And we didn't. I think we've now found a new way to not only get to market faster, but we found a way to have a dramatically lower cost business, an mm -hmm. order of magnitude better than anyone out there. And that was forced on us partly because we didn't have... Twenty million dollars, a hundred million dollars. Okay, so just to be clear, is this a prototype or is this a pr 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 production unit that you've got here? That's have you got customers? What, 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 what's the status now? So we, we launched on December second. It was in production, and uh, we're selling commercially live. We have a couple hundred users. Right. Um, a bunch of them are in the U.S. A lot of them are around the world. Right. And uh, it's a combination of consumers, small businesses, and uh, po happy to say that the feedback has been very positive. And the good news is with most businesses that you hope that you have customers, they like it and they'll tell other people. And that's exactly what happened. We're seeing some people try it within a family or business. And then the best thing is a few days later, a week later, you get another order for more and, and we're happy to be in that stage right now. Okay. And, and you're now finding through, through a viral e e effect that you're getting channels coming to you asking you if they can sell it on for you. It's partly that, and I think it's partly, as, as Wayne talked about it, when you have relationships and people that you know in the industry over the years, uh, they call you up because they know that they can trust you and you can deliver and you have integrity, which is also an important thing. And a lot of the business that we're getting today is people know that we have a team that can deliver, they know that we have a team that has integrity, and uh, they know that when we say we're going to do something, we do it. And uh, you know, sometimes when you're in a new company, you think just because you have a good idea that you can just plow through. Um, but having the relationships that we have has allowed us to completely shortcut a lot of the the nonsense and, and gates that people put up in our way, and I think that's, uh, you know, it's an unfair advantage we have, but we're taking advantage hey, of it. Hey, take advantage. <laughs> I've always believed in, un in un un unfair advantages. <laughs> we've we've uh, gotten a lot of uh, press for a small early stage company. We've gotten an awful lot of press as well. Back in December when we launched, we sent out a notice and got a lot of coverage because it was a fairly unique idea. Here's a publicly available, you know, telephone number mm -hmm. based video phone service. Uh, and then Scott was at the CES show in uh, January, and we got very nice coverage there as well. Mm -hmm. And just uh, a week or a week and a half ago, he was at IT Expo down in uh, Florida showing it, and that's, uh, again, more press and more people just walking by. That's much more of a trade show, and people were looking at, at what we had and saying, this is very interesting. We'd like to talk with you about some customers or, or some channels. And the other thing we do is we, we eat our own dog food, as the expression goes. Yep. So Everybody in the office, they only use our service for video. There is no backup. You have to use that day in, day out. And also at home, we've given ourselves only home lines that have video, no 
no backup lines, if you will. And that what that helps us to oh, do is great. establish confidence and that we know that we we start to use it and get more experience with our own product. Right. And that's helped us be better advocates because we're actually using what we uh, preach. Okay. Um, we're starting to run a little bit uh, late on time here, so uh, we're heading towards the wrap-up. Are there any last um, insights you'd like to offer for entrepreneurs? So i start with, with, with you, Wayne. Gosh, um, I don't know how to answer that question because the, the obvious one is you know, pick a good business plan that has a sustainable advantage in a big market and an unfair advantage. And I think that's what we have here. There's uh, uh, getting out in front and being the dominant player here has uh, self-reinforcing effects, and uh, that's part of the reason I think it's attractive. Um, the other is to have people who can bring the right level of passion and drive to it. And passion, we have to remember, is a root word of pain and suffering. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have to be you have to like it enough to bear some of the pain of startups as well, which okay. uh, is uh, a good test of the character of the people you're working with. Okay. Well, Scott, anything I, from yourself? Yeah, well, I, I certainly agree with Wayne that the most important decision you're ever going to make is to pick the right market and the right business. That's mm -hmm. the most important. But beyond that, I think you have to appreciate as an entrepreneur that it's a roller coaster. And there are incredible highs and ups, and then there are incredible downs. And the most important thing you have to do is try as best you can to keep an even keel and just wake up every morning, get out of bed, and just do what you have to do. And if you can do that and keep your head about you, then you'll, you'll probably do okay. Terrific. Scott, Wayne, thank you both very much indeed for coming along. Uh, it's time to wrap up, wrap up now. Um, so thank you for sharing your, your experiences and insights. And uh, it's thank you and good night from s -Phase and the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur. And look out for our next show next month. Thank you very much. So. I, I was...